and that uh, the, the woman is pregnant and doesn't know what to do, and so they try to educate them on all their options. Uh, they definitely educate them on the, the, uh, the positives of keeping that child, and they try to put in place a lot of support systems so they choose to keep that child. Um, I, I, I want to say this past year that it, there was 89 children that did not get aborted because of their efforts. Um, yes. But there's many thousand per day that, that do get aborted. So it's, it's something they're trying to do because there are a lot of women that have had abortions and suffer a lot of grief afterwards, a lot of regret afterwards, and so they're trying to work with that also. But I'm excited about also they're trying to include the young men in the process to say, you know what, you can be a man and step up and we want to help you be able to do that. They've got some classes for the guys too. Uh, so hopefully they all pitch in, the parents and whatnot, have an understanding too. So it's a good cause. I have a poem I want to read called My Old Hat. My Old Hat. Hey, that's my hat you're laughing at. So just one doggone minute. That hat has been kicked and tronked half flat right while my head was in it. It has kept the hot sun off my head. Why, I've even slept in it at night. So it has a right to show somewhere, and I'm claiming that same right. The dehorning blood and tractor grease and the groove across the crown are memories of the good old days before I started winding down. Why, it's been shrunk by rain and hail till it wouldn't even fit, but I just soaked it in the horse's trough and went right on wearing it. No, it's not a name brand hat, and I don't recall how much it cost, or all the rigs that ran over it, or how many times it's been lost. Sometimes in summer heat I'd weaken and trade it for a straw. Then I'd have to hunt it up again when the wind took my new one down the draw. Well, there's no throat latch or fancy band. And that flat hat has never worn a feather. It's just blood and dirt and on a sweat that holds it all together. Oh, I have seven uh, ex wrist out of the resist, uh, excuse me, resist all hats that I wear when I'm in town. But I want to be under this old one when the chips are coming down. My resist all is as good as new, but while it's been hanging on the rack, this old beat up hat and I have been halfway to heck and back. Through runaways and thunderstorms, and at times when I've been lost, that hat, hat stuck by me and brought me back, no matter what the cost. After all the years together, I guess it's no mystery. It's my old hat you're looking at, but what you see is really me. Revelations 22, 18 and 19 says this. Revelations 22, and, oh, I've got to flip to it here. Oh, wait, yeah, I forgot to flip it I thought I had it written down. My old hat. For I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book, meaning the Bible, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. You know, I kind of think this old hat, it stands for what it stands for, and he doesn't add anything to it, he doesn't change it, he just lives in it. And it's the same with the Word of God. It, it was written, and it doesn't need to be changed, it doesn't need to be tweaked for anything. And so we have a lot of guys at the men's study, or a lot of guys that I know that have been Christians a long time, you look at their Bible, and it's worn. It's not pretty. It's tattered, it's torn, it's got stuff written all over it. They don't even know when they wrote it, but they wrote some important stuff. So when you see someone's Bible and it looks a little bit tough, know that they've carried that Bible for many a year. And that's all they need, just like this guy was talking about his hat. Don't change a word in the Bible. Amen and amen. So I was blowing snow for several hours. I got like a sunburn on my face even. So, yeah, it's a bright day out there, but how many of you like the sun? Yeah, it's been a while since we saw that even, so I'm going to take that as a good year. What? Warm. Yes, warm. Yeah, there was some dripping snow. So tonight's sermon is called, What Do You Value? What Do You Value? Now, this winter, uh, a lot of people are talking about different things, and it's obvious to see what people value. Okay? A lot of people value their trip out of state. They get to go south. Some people got to go south for several weeks. Some for just a week, but if you have a trip coming up or you went on a trip, you pretty much value that this year. Some people value having a nice snowblower. Um, we've been blessed many years ago. We bought a John Deere lawnmower with a nice snowblower on it. It has blown snow. You can't name it. And so we blew our driveway part way. I got to finish that tomorrow. But went over and did the, the next door neighbors, which was horrific, and then the next door neighbor after that, which is perfect. So I think they value my snowblower too. I think they. they 
they always have a smile on their face when you start blowing their driveway and they can just kind of come out and tinker with the shovel and whatnot and not have to worry about it. So we value those kind of things. A lot of you guys value some of the snow plow or you value the snow plow that you have. A lot of people value that you shoveled off your roofs or you value somebody that will come and shovel off your roof. That's even better, isn't it? Amen. And so this kind of year, is, as the winter kind of builds up, we come to realize that just when it looks at the winter kind of things, there are a lot of things that we start to value. Now, a lot of us say we don't value the snow very much. We've had plenty of that. But again, <clears throat> it's been dry a few years, so maybe we need that moisture to kind of do a catch-up. So we realize that snow plows and snow blowers and someone that's willing to plow or snow blow for us are all good things. We value those things. We value the calendar. How many of you are saying it's March? Sooner or later, the chances are that it might warm up enough so that we can have mosquitoes and wood ticks. Right? I mean, we're, who's looking forward to slapping a mosquito? Yeah! Until the day it starts. <laughs> and then we'll be here whining like balling calves about that. You know we will. We've got to have hope. We've got to have hope that spring's coming. Uh, I maybe shared this last week, but I looked up the definition of hope, and nowadays they call hope wishing, wishing for something. Oh, I, I hope it doesn't snow anymore. I hope the snow melts fast. I hope I don't have to go through another rainstorm. Whatever it may be, we hope for a lot of things. I, I hope the pizza's ready. I hope, they, I hope they're going to have chicken tonight when we go home. We hope for a lot of things. I mean, wishing. But then it has this. It says an archaic definition, which means old, like some of you guys are archaic sitting here. The old definition says trust. Trust. So hope in the Bible means that we will trust in God. So looking at the calendar, we're going to hope, we're going to trust that as the days progress, we're going to see the snow disappear, the green grass, well, the mud first, then the green grass is going to come, and then the bugs will come. Before long, we're looking forward to fall because we're sick of the hot, humid summers. God works it out so perfect. Then we enjoy the fall, and then we come into winter, and then we look forward to spring again. So he kind of prepares us for things. And so we realize that we value a lot of things. I mean, just think about the things that you value in life. The definition of value is this. It says to regard something as important or regard it as worthy or regard it as useful, something that's useful. I mean, that's kind of how we look at value. Uh, it can be a person or principles or standards of behavior. We can say we have certain values that we try to stand by. The, the Bible is full of all kinds of values or morals, you could say, that we try to stand by. God has some values that he says, please live this way because that's how I live. Imitate me, the Bible says. And so we realize that there are values of things that are, you know, very simple. The value of my snowblower is probably pretty high this year because things are looking good. But if you have a snowmobile the last few years, not so valuable. There wasn't much snow. And so we can put value on monetary things, but we're talking about more of the deeper things of life. The things that we truly can value. Whether it's family or relationships or children or your health or whatever it might be, we have those kind of values. Sometimes we lose track of that when we're shoveling and we kind of get into other thoughts and other ideas. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, where it would say your value, that's where your heart will be also. In other words, if you're really valuing something, you can usually tell if someone has a lot of value in something. If, it's, if they love their cows, they talk a lot about their cows. If they love the Vikings, we pray for them, but they still love the Vikings, right? You can tell pretty quickly if someone values golfing or values their children, they pull out their wallet and they got like 42 pictures. And they show you every step from the day they were born, the next day, the next day. It's like the old slideshows. Here he is one day old. Here he is two days old, three days old. And he's 17 years old now. It's like, I don't want to stay this long, right? You can tell what people value often by what they talk about, what they purchase, where they hang out, and what they do. Values can also sometimes have too high a price. In other words, we value something, we desire to do it, we desire to have it, but we decide that it's just too high of a cost to pay. How about dieting? Man, I want to, my doctor says, lose some weight, right? And I'm like, you know what? That's a good value. I value having good health. I value being in shape. So what do I need to do, doc? Just kind of take a pill or two? Well, cut out butter and pasta and bread and all these shrimps and all these things. It's like... Man, that is a high cost to pay to have this health. Now, I can either live or I can live, right? I just soon live and go home to heaven a little faster and enjoy what I ate here. In other words, we value a lot of things. You might value the idea of owning a home and you just can't wait to get a home. You go to the top of the bank and realize how much it's going to take down and the interest rates and all these different things. And you say, you know what? 
I value owning my own home, but I just can't afford it. I can't take that risk. It's, it's too much. The cost is too high. And it comes even that when we come to Jesus Christ. It's like we read what he wants us to value. We read what he wants us to live like, but we have to decide in our own personal lives, do we value it enough to surrender to it? Will I surrender certain sins? Will I give up time or efforts? Will I even put some money in the offering tray when it comes about? Do I, do I value Christ enough to hand him a buck or two? I, I just don't know. We struggle with those things. We, we got to decide how much of Christ do we value. Because Christ values us enough to die on the cross, doesn't he? That's a pretty tough comparison. Hmm. This much here, or do that. He, he gave everything, but... You know, do I help here? Or do I go downstairs and serve some food? Whatever it might be, we have to decide, do we value Christ and what he stands for and what he wants for us enough to put him into our life and then live that way? The Bible says he wants to give us an abundant life. Do we value that enough to receive that abundant life? Because the opportunity is on the other side is to have Satan come and steal, kill, and destroy what you have. And so many of us, it makes no sense to any of us, including me, as to why I would choose to do things that put me on Satan's side rather than have this abundant life that Christ has for me. Why do we do that? Do I value this more? Well, my flesh does. My spirit wants to go this direction, but God wants to have the Holy Spirit. He keeps guiding and he counsels me to get closer to Christ, but we struggle with that. Our flesh values flesh. I want the immediate gratification. I want my uh, stick of butter and some shrimp. <laughs> Who cares about weight loss? Maybe tomorrow. You know when I lose weight the best or when I diet the best? I'm most successful between meals. <laughs> and I am perfect. I'm on my diet perfect between meals and snacks. Amen. Last night I had maple. How many of you like maple nut ice cream? Well, it's kind of, it's hard to find anymore. It's, I don't think the young people, you guys eat maple nut ice cream? No. no it's not, it's not hip enough anymore. So when you find it, you got to eat it. And so I found this tub. And so last night I put like this chocolate stuff on, and then Sandy's like, here's some caramel stuff. And, it's like, <laughs> and then about a half hour later I said, I got a stomach ache. <laughs> Self-induced, right? But I valued it. I didn't care. I'll worry about the repercussions later. How many of us do that? I'm, I'm not going to worry about what's going to happen to me. I mean, Sandy sometimes struggles with ice cream. It makes her tummy. But she'll say, you know, I'll do it anyway. I'll pay the price later. <laughs> We have to combat, is it important enough to us? And so we've come to realize that. Bull riders, I, I think of bull riders a lot. If you've ever been to rodeos, those guys are, I don't know if they, part of their brain was never there. Because they're riding these bulls, it's like these things are crazy. And so they've got to ride this bull. Eight seconds isn't very long. You think my sermons are long. Eight seconds is a long time on a bull. All right? So they get on the bull, and the bull's snorting and snots flying and everything else, and they get their hands so dug in that they can't get loose, basically. And then the buck, you know, it's bucking around, and then they look, and the clowns and all of them are backing off because they know this thing's going to explode out of there. And then they say, yep, the, door, the gate swings open. I mean, guessing about that moment, you've got to decide how much you value this hobby you got. Because when it explodes, it's all over. You're either going to hang on or fall off, or he's going to come and run you over, whatever it might be. But... Do you, you know, in the midst of something, you also decide if you're going to value it or not. You might well, you think, golfing is going to be awesome. I just want to start golfing, but by the fifth hole, you're saying, this is boring. I don't want to do this. Anyone ever done curling? That's fine. You've made good choices. <laughs> I have curled. Curling is funner to play than it is to watch. Believe me. Now, this is my BC days, before Christ days. You know what my favorite thing with curling was? Your beer stayed cold all the time. In the bowling alley, it got warm. But if, when you're out there on the ice, it stayed cold. That was my big thing. We went and did that. So anyways, if you're going to curl and play the game, don't just watch because you'll value that game a lot more if you participate in it. I'll guarantee you that. So I'm going to go to Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. I'm going to read through those. This is the story of the rich young man. We've, we've preached on this. Pastors have preached on this for years. But we're going to talk about it because I think we have to realize that we're looking at how do we value things. Sometimes we think we got we value so much and we have it all figured out that everything's great. But then we come to realize we might be valuing the wrong things. We might be putting more of our eggs in the wrong basket. And so as we look at this, the rich young man, I just want to tell you the definition of being rich. Most of us think of cha-ching, cha-ching, ching, ching. It's a great deal of money or an abundance. Or opposite of that is poor, it's lacking those things. So we think of rich just like we think of values. You know, 
that house is worth $300,000. That's the value of that house. Somebody has the house and says, you know, I'm rich. I've got $300,000. It's all paid for. It's like my retirement. I'm going to sell that and I'm going to make it. I got money, money, money. But we're talking about rich in life, rich in Christ, rich in all the gifts he has for us, rich in that joy that he has for us. What kind of joy is it, Raymond? Unspeakable. Unspeakable joy. That's right. That love he has for us, that peace. He's the Prince of Peace. How many of you, that since you came to know Jesus Christ, if you're truly following him and truly trying to do the best you can to be all that he wants you to be, have found more love, more joy, more peace in your life than ever before? Have you noticed how the riches of money and stuff? Less value. I don't worry so much about that. I need it to get stuff, like maple nut ice cream and butter, so like <laughs> and aspirin or tones or whatever it might be. We value those, but I don't value some of the material things like I used to because I realize that they're very petty. And even if I live 80 years on this earth, that is just a in the scheme of ever, forever. I could build up the biggest monument to me that you could ever find on this earth, but it's nothing in comparison to time. We dig for gold. I like to watch the gold show on TV. They're digging for gold all summer long. They got $7 million worth of gold. Up there is asphalt. In heaven, it's asphalt. You walk on it. If you were going up there grabbing all the, all the asphalt, putting in your pockets, they'd say, are you nuts? That's just asphalt. No one's gold. It's just asphalt up there. We, the riches that we have on this earth are nothing. But the riches we can have from Jesus Christ because of what he did on that cross, priceless. If we can tune into those and adapt those things and put those into our life. So here's a rich young man. This, is, this guy apparently has got, he's got the lot of money. He's got the bills. So here he is. He's, he's running along in the road trying to catch Jesus. He's probably got so much gold in his pocket he can barely catch him. It says in verse 17, Now as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. And so Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So we'll start at the first verse of 17, and we're just going to go through and get the nuggets out of that. We're talking about gold mining, so we're going to mine the gold out of this story. First off, it says that this is a rich man, but he came running, wanting to know what Christ had for him. I mean, when's the last time you've run to church, or run to the Bible, or run to your prayer room, or run to take time to meditate because you want to be closer to God? I mean, this guy's running. He doesn't care who sees him. Here's a rich young man who probably drops most of everything and begins to run after Jesus to ask him this question. He has a value. He has a desire to understand what it's going to take to enter the kingdom of God. He has all these possessions, but yet he knows he would like to, he would like to end up in heaven. That's a good guy. And that's a good runner. I pray that we would take the time to run to Christ with questions that we have. To run to Christ with our worries. To run to Christ with our, our uh, needs. To run with Him with our love and our peace and our, our, uh, you know, our worship to Him. Take time to run. Don't worry about what people think. So it said that He went out on the road. He came running and He knelt before Him. I mean, that's a sign of submission. A sign of honor. 
Good teacher, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. He's more or less saying, you're talking to me. You're saying that I'm good. I am God. God is good. But then he talks about the commandments. He says, do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I kept from my youth. So here we have this rich young guy that's been doing what he thinks he needs to do, and he can say, you know what, God, I've been keeping those commandments. I, I mean, he's feeling fantastic. It sounds like everything's going fantastic. It sounds like I'm on the right path. Man, for my youth, I've been keeping those things. This sounds like this is going to be a no-brainer, a slam dunk. He's going to tell me in the next sentence, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, because you've been doing all these things. Well, do you know there are people that go to church all their lives every Sunday that aren't saved, that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior? It's true. It's true. And unless you accept Jesus Christ, unless you make that personal desire to know Christ as your personal Savior, you can come to this building every week, or you can come twice a week, or every day, but if you don't accept Jesus Christ, all you're doing is coming to this church and worshiping God. You know who He is, but you've never received Him as your Lord and Savior. That's possible. I think it's happening more than we even want to know. And so if you're sitting here today going, this guy, this fat guy up there who eats maple nut ice cream and chews butter like candy, doesn't know what he's talking about. The Bible speaks that we have to accept Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so we have to choose to accept him. Nicodemus says, what, what do I need to do? He said, be born again. Oh, we hear that word, and people go, oh, that's flaky stuff. What he's saying is we've been born, but now we have to accept Jesus Christ in, into our lives to be born into his kingdom, to be born into his, to be one of his children, to enter, enter heaven. So if you're sitting here and you've never done it, realize that this rich young man did all kinds of things obedient to God, but yet we come to realize that he's saying, what do I need to do to be saved? I've been doing all these things and you're able to say it. And how wonderful it would be if God would say, you know what, Deb? You've been to church 812 Sundays in a row. But if he doesn't know you, that's all he can tell you. That's all he can tell us. So we want to have Jesus Christ as our Savior. And so this guy's asking some good questions. And so far he's liking it. But here's what his answer is. Now, we're expecting him to say, well done, man. You're here. It's just any time you're going to be up with me. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. The rich young man. The rich young man that kept all the commandments except which one? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so God is pointing out to him in love. Here's the... Here's why Christians, we get a bad rap. We have to see someone that's sinning, and we go to them and say, I just want to let you know that, that what you're doing there, that it's not, you know, Jesus isn't going to accept that. He's, he's going to say that that's wrong. I can read you where he wrote it. I'm not making that decision, sir. I'm just letting you know that here's what he wrote, and I'm kind of worried because you're doing those things, and I just want to make sure you're aware of that. And I do that in love. Because if I don't tell you that, you may never learn that, and you may end up in hell, Right? How many of you have had someone speak into your life and you say thank you, even though you might not like to hear it? Most of us, our parents, did that all the time. We thought they were morons. Oh, you're kind of out of step, Dad. <laughs> you know, I'm 18. I got the world by the tail. <laughs> Four years later, I'm like, Dad, you were so right. It hurts. <laughs> we have people that speak love and life into us a lot of times and we don't want to hear it because it doesn't fit what we want to do. And so in love, he shared truth. Man, it's hard for us Christians because we get, we're get we told we're intolerant and we're haters. All, this, all we want to do is share truth. And I'll tell you what, I can tell this guy, if I was telling this guy that, I'd say, you got one thing you got to work on, but hey, buddy, I got 14 of them I'm working on. So I'm not judging you, I'm just telling you, you've got some things to work on just like I do. In fact, I might have more than you, but Jesus makes a way because I love you. Not that I hate you, that I point out things that can kill you. We feel that sometimes, don't we? You know, put on your seatbelt. Ah, uh, why? Well, it apparently saves most lives. And then someone will say, oh, no, no, no. There was a time that if I would have had my seatbelt on, I would have been killed. Yes, there are those moments. But the majority of the time, they're deciding that seatbelts are good things. Better than mom's arm back in the day. 
Oh, thanks, Mom, because you got this metal dash a quarter inch stick. <laughs> you know, no airbags there. And so we realize that, you know, he is telling him this in love. So I just want to encourage you if you're reading the word and you come across something that kind of makes you tingle because you don't like what it says, that, my gosh, I don't, I value being a Christian, I value the Lord, but you're asking me to give up this? You're saying that what I do all the time and love to do is wrong? you got to decide if you value Christ enough to say, I'll release that. I'll surrender that. Because not only that, he says that you need to get rid of your things. He says, just don't go dump them. He said, go help the poor. Now you're serving me. You're helping those that have need. And then he says, now pick up your cross and follow me. He wants him to do more than just give away his money. He wants him to give away his money to a good cause. And then once you're done with that, now come and serve me. Come and walk with me. I mean, how, what is it like when the creator of the universe says, please come? And serve me. Please come and walk with me. Please come and be part of who I am. Man, the president's never done that to me. There isn't a senator that's ever come up to me and said, oh, please be part of who I am. But yet the creator of the universe that created everything says, I want you to be my child. I want to take care of you. I want to give you an abundant life. I want you to serve me. I want you to do the things that I ask you to do. That's a pretty cool thing. Too many times we minimize it. How many times we sit back and say, well, Lord, let me decide if I value that enough. And then the people that say, well, I don't need Christ at all. Really? Nope, don't need him at all. Then quit breathing his air. Let's see if you need him. Oh, how you feeling now? You need him now? Somebody says they don't need Christ, then quit breathing his air for a while and see if you need him. That'll get the point across pretty fast. Two to three minutes. <laughs> Just be ready to revive them if you need be. So he tells them that in love. My friends, we, we hear it from the pulpit in love. We speak it to each other in love. We read it in love. Realize it's to help us and not to hurt us. Not, it's not about being intolerant. It's about being that Christ has certain standards. He has certain values that he says, I will tolerate or I will accept other things I can't. All you need to do is live like that and you'll have an abundant life. But we fight it because we value flesh and our choices oftentimes more than his. It says in verse 22, But he was sad, sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. It's going to cost a lot. Christ is saying it's going to cost you a lot to come and serve me, son. You've got a lot of possessions. Now, for those possessions, he's not saying you can't have any. He's not saying let's all get rid of our clothes and give everything away and stand here naked and say, I guess now we can serve you, Lord. Use your possessions for Christ. If you have some money in your pocket and you can help someone like we did in Haiti, that's fantastic. We had a couple that said, you know what, I would like to give a certain amount. And this amount has come into my head, it was $300. But we don't really have that $300. That's going to put us pretty thin. But we feel led to do it. So we prayed about it. Now, I'm not excited because they followed through and did it. I'm not so excited that they gave the $300, although that's fantastic. That boosts us boosted us way up here at the giving here at the church for Haiti. And those people in Haiti, 300 bucks is going to feed many people for a long time. I'm excited they stepped out <laughs> in faith and did it. They had the $300 that God gave them and they said, you know what God, because there's a bigger need than us and you're feeling, we're feeling led to do it, we will surrender it to you. That's victory in their lives. Forget about Haiti at the moment. That's God just did something fantastic in their life. And we prayed that God would, would see that. God would bless them for that. Not necessarily financially. It might be in a whole, whole new way. But what a victory for someone to hand over cash when they don't even have it, but they want to give it, feel led to do it, they do it anyway. I'm not saying that so we buff up our money. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they had victory because they stepped over that boundary where somebody would draw a line and say, well, I'll give you three or four bucks. I'll spend 20 on this over here, but I'm only going to give you three or four bucks because I don't value it enough. I value this. I'll spend hundreds on this, but I don't value you, Christ. I don't value enough to give so that you can use it to go to Haiti in different places. I'm not trying to guilt anyone. I'm just saying, what a victory for that couple. What a victory. What an excitement for me to see somebody step out. I pray that God takes that 300 and blows it into 300,000 somehow over there. And he does it in their lives too. This rich young man had an opportunity to serve Christ in the greatest ways of giving out of his bounty. He didn't have to start. He could have gave out of his bounty. Lord, yes, take it. Let's give it to the poor. But he went away sorrowful. Gosh, 
I wanted that kingdom of God. I wanted to get to heaven. I wanted to, I wanted to follow you, Lord, but it's, it's too high a cost. I give away all my stuff. What he was saying was, get rid of your God other than me. And so he might be saying that to somebody here tonight. Give up your God. It's not him. Whether that's sin, whether that's money, whether that's whatever, you know what it is. Holy Spirit, right now, speak into every person's mind and tell them exactly who their God is. Everyone's hearing something right now. If you're not hearing Jesus Christ, you want to change your life so that you can't hear Jesus Christ. It's so easy to put other things before Christ. So easy. Because we're living in it. It's here. I've got it. Keep that in mind. Ask, ask the Holy Spirit every once in a while. Show me who my God is. Be ready for the answer. And if he says it's not God, don't go away sorrowful. Go away with tears in your eyes and say, thank you for giving me that clarification. I now want you, Lord. What do I need to do to put you first in my life? And have Christ in your life first. That was the whole problem with this rich young man. He was hanging on to things that he created, the possessions that he built up. He put his trust, and here it says, when he says it the second time, he says, for those who trust in riches, enter the kingdom of God. Those who trust in riches. If we're going to trust in our power and our might and our creations and all that we create, and not God, we're putting it in the wrong place. But the world will tell you you're putting it in the exact right place. The exact right place. And to pick up your cross and to follow me. Meaning, will you sacrifice yourself on a daily basis to serve me? Will you sacrifice $300 that you could use somewhere else? Maybe for fun, maybe for a trip, maybe whatever it might be, but you've given that now. Will you give that to me so that I can use it so that I can bless you for giving that to me? Well done, good and faithful servants. Absolutely. That's what we have to strive to be. This young man thought he had it. He was doing a lot of different things, but they weren't the things because God was never his God. His possessions were. His possessions were. He looked at him with love, and the guy goes away sorrowful. You know what? What, what do you notice about how Christ reacts to that at that very moment? Did you say, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Well, you mean you're going to leave the church if I ask? Well, okay, how about just a couple bucks? You know, if that's too much, what are you willing to give me? I don't want you leaving. Let him walk. You let him walk. He's not going to beg us back. He's not going to grab us by the leg and drag us back into his kingdom. It's something that he wants us to do because we love him. Because we love him enough and want to serve him enough and realize what he's done for us. And we want to live in that. So we come towards him. We're like this rich young man. We come running towards him saying, I want to be in your presence, Lord. How many of you in your B.C. before Christ days made a mess of your life? Man, did I... I still struggle. I still mess up. Ask Sandy. She'll vouch for that. <laughs> but man, before, like I said, talk about possessions. We had 25 houses in 22 years. We moved different states. Miles here, miles there. There was no contentment whatsoever. I had all the possessions you could imagine. And we moved and moved and moved. And we had so many possessions, we had to get two U-Haul trucks. Sometimes they moved us with a semi. If I had the right job, they paid for us to be moved. Just to get more possessions. But I wasn't content. Sandy wasn't content. She had to go along and help pack it. Go along for the ride. Thank you for doing that. How many of us have been like that? We're on the wrong track. What's your real God? What is your greatest possession in your life? Is it your relationship with Christ? Or is it something you got sitting at home or driving here or whatever it might be? See, Christ doesn't say we can't have those things. But he says, put me first. Put me first. The rest will take care of itself if you'll just put me first. He never leaves us nor forsakes us, the Bible says. He, he provides for us, but you know what? He might provide a car, but it might not be a, a 2020 car. It might not be, you know, the nicest car in the lot. But it'll be a car. It might not be the nicest house that everyone else has, but it'll be a house. One of the... Uh, um, Missionaries in India, I've shared this story. In India, in Bombay, I think it's like, I don't know how many million people live in one city. People die every night on the streets of starvation and sickness. 
So they go around with death carts every morning and try to pick up the dead people and get them off the streets. But that's, that's kind of nice to do if you got tourists in the area. And so this man was working with a lot of people and they came to know the Lord and he said, I never saw anyone that accepted the Lord in the ministry that I was aware of ever on a death cart from starvation. God provided a way. He provides a way if we will trust him. This man might have been able to, to duplicate or quadruple what he had if he gave it all to Christ and then walked with Christ. And he missed out on the greatest possession he could have had, the greatest riches he could have had. It says the rich young man, he was not rich at all. He just had a lot of money. We're rich if you know Jesus Christ. You're rich. Rich beyond measure. Rich beyond so many people that don't know him don't understand what rich is. We're not the Kardashians. I just saw a picture where the Kardashian they had a, a one and a half year old one of their little kids had a $14,000 purse and like a $1,500 shoes on now that little child doesn't know any better. That little child's just playing with whatever they got them. But I guarantee all of her, and then they play with like blocks and sticks and sand. <laughs> but I don't know if they have Jesus Christ in that family. I don't know. The world would say they're rich beyond measure. They're million billionaires. I don't know. But are they rich at all? Are we rich at all? We are if Christ is our God. But if he's not our number one God... If something else is, if life is, a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, kids, whatever it might be, your house, your cars, your jobs, your finances, your 401k, uh, you know, sin, whatever it might be, pornography, whatever it might be, addictions, whatever it may be. If you're putting those before God, you're not rich. You're not rich. You're poor. Now the Lord loves to help the poor. He died on the cross for the poor because we all were poor. We had nothing without Christ. Now we have everything that matters. So I just hope you pay attention to the story of the rich young man and how the, the drama played out. He, he went, he understood, he kept a lot of commandments. He felt really good about his actions. But 1 Samuel 16, 7, my favorite verse says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, the actions, but the Lord looks at the, the heart. He looks inside us. What do you really value? You can tell me it's God, but you don't have to tell me that. He knows. He looks at your heart. That's what you want to have, look at your heart. Please give me a heart exam, oh Lord. Hold your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord. I thank you for the story of the rich young man who had a desire to know you more, had a desire for the kingdom more, but Lord, he realized that there was a cost, a value. And for him, it was too high to pay, and he walked away sad. In fact, he chose his money but he left sad, knowing that he was giving up something even greater, but he just couldn't hand over his own worldly possessions that he had in his pocket. Heavenly Father, I pray that for anyone here tonight that is in that mode, where what you have in your pocket or what you're living in or what you're driving is more important than God, anything more important than God, Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict us right now in love. Conviction means I want to tell you what you need to change because I love you. Because I died on that cross for you, and that's worth it to me. Heavenly Father, help us to know what that is. And then I just pray that you'd put a hedge of protection around them, because Satan will come to them in the next half hour and say, that was just a sermon. It's not you. You go to church all the time, and you're here all the time. You're fine. Don't let them, don't let them blind your ears, or your eyes and your ears, that you don't hear the truth. So Heavenly Father, I ask for a hedge of protection that we can grow in you, hold back Satan so that we can have some time and some clarity, Lord, to be with you, to understand what you desire so that we can be your children and you can be our God. Heavenly Father, I pray this for everyone that sits here tonight. I pray this, Lord, that we realize the possessions of this earth are nothing. We're not rich or poor until we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Then we're rich, rich in Christ. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen, amen and Amen. All right. <clears throat> Downstairs today, there are no vegetables. Everyone applaud that. <laughs> uh, we had a couple of the gals were going to make stuff. We had them not because we didn't know uh, just how many people would come. So there is down there all kinds of homemade cookies, uh, Rice Krispie bars. No? Homemade cookies, <laughs> ice cream. Other bars, ice cream and toppings and different things like that. No maple nut. That didn't make it here. <laughs> so if you want to stick around, we're having like an ice cream social, I guess, kind of just to celebrate all the snow we have. So 
didn't add enough light. So, anyways, please do that. Anything else? Other announcements right off the top? We're going to sing Happy Trails. If you can stick around, go downstairs and uh, spend a little bit of time with fellowship. It stays lighter longer, so you don't have to worry about going home in the dark. That's nice. So we're getting there, folks. We're getting there. One day.